Friday if it wasn't for the light, I wouldn't be where I am today. This is Justin back from Books, Bricks, and Boards. It's been a few days since I uploaded a video. I've been pretty busy at work, but uh, thought today I would talk about a problem that I have as well as one of the nice side benefits of that problem. So as you can tell by my shelves, I like to collect lots of different RPG books and board games. But today we're talking about RPGs because every once in a while, I don't want the crunch of a Pathfinder or a Dungeons and Dragons or a GURPS. And I just need something that's going to be quick, something that I can shoot from the hip, and something that is flexible enough I can play a lot of different styles with it. So today, what I'm going to talk about are my top five light rules systems for RPGs. Right, how many did we lose? Gawain, Hector, and Bors, that's five. Three, sir. Three, three. And here is my number five rules light RPG system. This is Quest. If you are a regular uh, viewer of the channel, you know that I actually put this in my uh, top five RPGs in a single tome video as well. Quest is actually like a D20 version of the Powered by the Apocalypse system. This page is the gist of all of the rules, and it's a fail-forward system. It's something where you can actively move the story forward whenever you roll low. So a 6 to 10, you still succeed in your action, but you get a couple of setbacks. But Quest is very simple. Uh, the monster stats are extremely simple. Um, it is pretty flexible. There are some interesting takes on uh, what would be considered classes in most games. Uh, basically, you get some special abilities that are associated with that. Um, you do not have any real stats outside of your hit points. Um, there is no min-maxing in this game. It is something that you can teach to people that are not familiar with RPGs. There's a lot of creativity in the way that the items are presented. I've actually used those in some of my D&D games as well because they were so well thought out. And just generally, the book does a very good job of keeping this in the vein of just go by the core mechanic and see what happens. You don't have to have a special mechanic for uh, for swimming or for leaping or for any of the things. You just do the roll the die to test your luck. Another nice addition to Quest that makes it even more handy is there are these cards that have all of the special abilities associated with the different classes, which makes it even easier for new players. I will tell you that my first time running Quest, it was supposed to be a D&D &D night, and like half of the group didn't show up. We didn't want to call it quits, but we couldn't really do what we had planned. So I said, well, I've got this new game. We can try it out. I am somewhat familiar with the rules. I've read through them. So um, we played a quick off-the-cuff game of Quest in a homebrew world that I had created, and it went over so well that the entire group uh, voted that we should play Quest at our next session. Uh, they enjoyed it that much. It was just such a nice break from the grind and the heavy weightiness of the rules of 5th edition, which is what we were playing at that time. So again, that is my number five Rules Light RPG, Quest. If you want to pick up Quest, you can go to www.adventure.game. And it is, like I, I can show you here, a beautiful book 
full color, and it is a wonderful introduction to the role-playing hobby. Quest. Coming in at number four, this is the Sharp Swords and Sinister Spells RPG by Old Skull Publishing. Uh, Diogo Nogueira is actually the author, and he did a lot of the artwork as well. Uh, for those of you that are into Dungeon Crawl Classics, Diogo does some artwork for them, and you can really see it in the artwork within this book. Now, this entire book is like 46 pages, and it has a lot of good stuff. You could definitely use this in your fantasy RPGs other than just sharp swords and sinister spells. So the really great things about this, it, first off, it's kind of like a heavily modded version of the Black Hack. It uses a roll under the attribute system for resolution. Uh, for combat, uh, you roll under modified by the relative level. So for example, if I've got a very high strength and, and normally I can hit 75% of the time because I just have to roll under my strength. If I'm fighting something that's stronger than me, then that's going to adjust that down and make it a little bit harder, which is something a lot of these rules light games do overlook and it makes combat rather trivial if you're playing more of a, a campaign where, where characters get more powerful. Um, another cool thing about this particular system is it has a spell system with risk involved. This is very evocative of the old pulps, you know, the Conan, the barbarian type stories where sorcery is weird and it can have bad effects. Um, it also kind of reminds me of Dungeon Crawl Classics, which makes sense because Diogo is a, a big fan of Dungeon Crawl Classics. Um, damage is based on weapon size. Uh, so all small weapons do a D4, all uh, medium-sized weapons do a D6, and all large weapons do a D8. The warrior class steps up a die for each of those. So a warrior would do a D10 with a large weapon like a two-handed sword. So it gives warriors... Uh, kind of a, a leg up in combat. You know, a lot of RPGs struggle to make the non-magical martial characters uh, hold their own. This is an interesting way to handle that in a very simple way. Um, armor reduces damage instead of making you harder to hit, which is kind of intuitive. Uh, but it also reduces your agility, which is equivalent to your dexterity in, in another uh type of RPG. And so by wearing heavy armor, you take less damage, but you also struggle with any skills or feats that would require agility. Um, the, the, the monsters in this are very simple to run, and they are also rather Lovecraftian a lot of times in their makeup, but everything's based on hit die. Their hit die determines kind of their their attack and how hard they are to uh, to uh, kill, and then they get some special abilities that make them unique. But otherwise, uh, other than the special abilities, all two hit die creatures are going to be the same. But then you know the special abilities is how you you make them interesting. Um, leveling up is an interesting, uh, interesting mechanic in this. Um, they, uh, each time that a character levels up, uh, they gain another hit die and they make an improvement roll for a chosen attribute and then their prime attributes. So basically they try to roll, if they roll above what their current attribute is, then they get to raise it by one. Uh, so you get a ch couple chances to level up your skills because, of course, everything, like I said, is based on a roll under on those attributes. So 
but there's also some cool random uh, adventure generators with names and places and antagonists and supporting characters and rewards involved. Very cool book. Uh, extremely affordable. And it's also seen some relatively good support. There's uh, the optional rules and tools uh, in the addendum. Um, this book is actually bigger than the, the core rules. Uh, it gives some... Uh, some different thoughts on some more classes, uh, races, uh, some different ways to handle things uh, regarding spells and, and things of that nature. But uh, So that would be a good buy if you were going to get into that. And then, because he just couldn't stop giving, Diogo also gave us Solar Blades and Cosmic Spells. Solar Blades and Cosmic Spells is essentially this system made for space opera. So this is basically a way that you could play Star Wars with the serial numbers filed off. Um, now you might wonder, how did this 45 page book become over 400 pages? Well, there is a lot of uh, different tables in here. Uh, there's a lot of different stuff specific to the sci-fi genre. Uh, to help you create worlds and galaxies and um, encounters in that area. And then also some very specific uh, equipment and vehicles based on the genre. So this, if you like this system but you're wanting to play some sci-fi, this would be your obvious choice. Again, this is Sharp Swords and Sinister Spells by Old School Old Skull Publishing. I actually ordered mine, I believe, from Drive Through RPG, and it was very inexpensive. Uh, as soon as I got this book and read it, I knew I had to buy everything else that uh, Diogo had released. So, Sharp Swords and Sinister Spells, that's my number four of my Rules Light RPGs. Okay, this next one, my number three, is the Index Card IP RPG, also known as IC RPG. Now, this one has a confusing name because uh, it really has grown a lot from its original uh, state. But uh, they actually have uh, index cards that you can buy that go along with this. I actually have a set of them. Uh, I can't think quite right now where I've got them, but you're going to have to take my word for it. You can get them on uh, drive through RPG, actually. But even though it has grown a lot from its roots, and it used to be played just on a series of index cards, and it still can be, um, what I really like about this is that it does use a unified mechanic to cover everything. Uh, basically, your stats uh, would be thought of in terms of uh, 5e you would just be looking at the mods you don't have an 18 in strength you have a plus four in strength so um, anytime that you do something there's going to be a target number for the whole scene and so it's going to be based on the difficulty you want that scene to have and everything in that scene is going to be based off of that target number with circumstance bonuses or penalties uh, based on the individual situation. For example, the boss of the encounter might be uh, a, a plus three target number, making him harder to hit than the minions, which might be a minus two, uh, but all of it's still hinging off of that original target number for the scene. So if that scene was a, a DC 12 target number, then Unlocking a locked chest would be the same target number as punching the guard in the face. And another thing where they have kind of a unified system here is the heart system. So everything in this game system is expressed in terms of effort. And so whenever you are looking at completing a task. Some tasks are just completed whenever you meet that target number with a test, but some require additional effort to finish up. So that is expressed in hearts. Uh, the most common thing that is going to be expressed that way is hit points. So a 
uh, a monster might have two hearts. Well, you might think, well, that's not very many hit points. Well, a heart is worth 10 effort, so that would be the equivalent of 20 hit points. By the same token, an extremely complicated lock could be two hearts, meaning that you roll for success, and if you succeed, then you roll to see how much effort you have accomplished there. Um, everything uh, that is done is done according to the tools that you are using. So whenever you do something with your bare hands, it's going to be a D4. Uh, when you use uh, the proper tools, your effort is going to be a D6. Whenever you use a laser or a gun, it might be a D8 for effort for damage. Um, so on and so forth. If you get a crit, I believe that you use a D12 added to the effort. I could be mistaken on that. Um, now this game system, actually, the, it just released with a new Master Edition, which is a beautiful book. Uh, it's got two ribbons uh, for holding your place. It's got the great uh, black and white artwork. Um, you know, this was all uh, a labor of love for uh, Hankerin Farinal. I can't remember his YouTube channel, but I have watched a ton of it. And this guy basically, as I understand, uh, he did basically all the art and all of the writing and the layout and everything himself in the older editions. And I think he did most of it here too. So this is what I was talking about with the effort. So if, if you succeed in something that requires effort to complete, um, using your bare hands, you roll a D4 for, to see how much effort you achieve. Uh, with basic tools or a basic weapon, you roll a D6. With guns or, uh, or something similar to that, you use a D8. With lasers or magic, you'd use a D10. And then um, you would add a D12 uh, if you rolled a 20, a natural 20 on your uh, check number. And, uh, and that is like the ultimate effort. So, um, so that's the basic system. And then um, a lot of these rules light RPGs, uh, including sharp swords and sinister spells that I talked about earlier, um, they have like a very simplified version of combat movement. So close, near, and far is a very common way to do that throughout these systems, and this is no different. Um, so the index card RPG, the basics of it are covered in about the first 17 pages here. Now, originally it was classless. Now it does have a class, but the classes here basically grant equipment and some very small impact special abilities uh, but they're they're not like the end all be all that you would find in like a D and D. They are just kind of some added flavor to what is a pretty free form character creation system. Uh, mods could go from uh, plus plus uh, to minus three in every scenario, and um, the book comes with some really cool stuff. Comes with uh, some different genre worlds that you can use. Alfheim is a fantasy version of the game, and then there's a uh, there's a space opera version. You've got some monsters here. You've got all sorts of different great tools for DMs. I know that a lot of folks have talked about buying this book. Just there's Vigilante City. Um, this one's been done for Dungeon Crawl Classic System too. It's a, a superhero version. And I think it's also in the Survive This line is wh where it started. But there's there's how to play superheroes in this system <clears throat> and some different enemies. Dr. Adam, God's Hand, Gujira, Ezra Evil. And <clears throat> throughout here... Oh, this, this is the uh, the blood and snow. This is like a caveman or Neanderthal uh, type of RPG world that you could play in. There's a cool magic system here. has some really neat 
ways to handle freeform spells. But there are a lot of uh, tables in here that you can use for creating adventures, for coming up with stories for your characters and how they view their role in the world. Um, you've got a neat D100 mo monster selector here. Um, tables to figure out <clears throat> what the monsters were doing whenever you came upon them, what their motivation was, some upgrades to make them unique. Um, a whole ancient loot table. Uh, and then there's also a shabby loot table, a cursed loot table, a sci-fi loot table, an epic loot table, bizarre loot table, uh, ghost mountain loot, magic loot, uh, and then you got a character sheet at the end here. But um, there is a limit. I think you can only have 20 pieces of equipment. I think 10 of it can be a use at a time. As you can see, the abilities, there's only spots for five abilities and three powers. I think the powers are only used in the Vigilante City version. And the abilities, you're not going to have a lot of them because this is really not a, a game that is focused on classes. This is a game that is just focused on freeform character creation. Again, can't say enough about this. This is a really cool system, and it may uh, work its way higher up my chart as I use it more. I haven't actually played the system itself. I have used some tools from it. Um, the other two I have played that I've talked about so far. All right, so we are on to my number two. This is the White Hack. This is the second edition of this game. Uh, it was created by Christian Mistrom. And um, this is, so this is 50, 60 pages here. One of the cool things that was included here is a way to play without dice. So this is a D6. You kind of Take a pen and whatever one you hit is the number that you got. Here is a D20 for the same thing. But um, most of this is actually stuff for building your world. Most of it is not actual rules. The actual rules of the game, for the most part, are in the first like 20 or so pages. Um, the cool things about the White Hack, it is a roll under system, much like a couple of the others that I've talked about. It has a really interesting bidding mechanic for doing challenged uh, tasks between two different groups. Um, it has some very um, interesting ways of handling class. The three classes in the game are the deft, the wise, and the strong. Um, they each have uh, some very simple uh, differences that make them unique and give them bonuses. Um, here are, so there's like a list of eight the, of special abilities that the strong can use. Um, the deft have uh, more abilities to handle uh, things that are out of combat. They're like your thieves, that kind of thing. And then the wise uh, would cover everybody else. And they, they don't have to be um, mages. They could be, the wise could be clerics. They could be alchemists. They could be bards. Uh, but each has their own advancement tables uh, with their uh, attack values and um, saving throws. This is their saving throws. How many groups they get, that's like their skills. That's things that are good at. The groups are like a broad category of skills. Um, And then raises are when you get to raise your attributes, which, of course, this is a roll under system, so raising an attribute is going to make you more successful uh, in everything that you do with that attribute. So the groups, um, as you 
use as you justify um, an action benefiting from your association with a group, then once per session for each group, you can get advantage on that roll. Just like D&D, you roll two dice and you keep the better of the two. So that is the very simple and concise white hack RPG. This is super cheap. Um, I think you actually may be able to download it for free. Um, one of the other things that is um, different about the white hack is going to be that it has free forms, variable spells. The spells are basically a negotiation between the game master and the player. Um, so that may or may not work with your group if, if you don't want to have that kind of back and forth to decide what you can do uh, with your players and their spells. Maybe this isn't for you. One of the, the cool things that is done different in this game, I think, than any of the other games that I have gone over that I've seen even, is the attack mechanic. Um, you have to roll between the AC and the attack value. So your AC is ascending. So if I have like six armor and the attack value of the guy attacking me is 15, he has to roll between 6 and 15. If he rolls a 5 or less, he's hit my armor, and he doesn't do any damage. If he rolls a 16 or more, he's missed me entirely. So it really kind of, that system very simply covers the aspects of dodging and absorbing damage through armor and uh, dexterity. Very free form, very simple. Um, the monsters in this are going to be very much like I described um, from uh, the earlier um, quest RPG. Uh, it's mainly just based upon um, the hit dice of the monster. They do have some AC values and movement and some special abilities, but for the most part, the monsters act very similarly and you just adjust them with special abilities to make them special. Again, this is uh, the White Hack and this is available on Drive Through RPG and I think you can get it through Lulu as well, if I can remember right. And the entire character sheet is the front of the book. So uh, this is all your stats. Strength, Dex, and Con, Attack Value, Movement, and Saving Throw. And then you have some special abilities based on your class and you carry a weapon. So super simple, very easy to use. Um, I have used the <clears throat> bidding mechanics from this in several of my games, and so I, I'm very happy with this purchase. There's also a lot of good stuff for uh, DMs in here. All right, and here is my number one Rules Light RPG. This is the Black Hack. So the Black Hack, was a spinoff of the White Hack, so named for the author. I um, can't remember the first name, but the last name was Black, I believe, David Black. And um, this system, I think this is the second or third edition of it, but um, you can get it in a lot of different uh, styles. Um, this one is the kind of the premium edition that has a lot of extra stuff for the DM. It has lots and lots of tables. Uh, it has some drop tables too, which I hadn't really seen used a lot. You can drop a coin or a piece of paper to randomly generate treasure. And there's also one for hit locations in here and some other stuff as well. But the black hack... Um, is going to be similar to the White Hack in that it's a roll under the attribute system. All rolls in the Black Hack are player-facing. So I actually finished up a campaign in Black Hack that I had started in another system, and the players really enjoyed it. Um, all the rolls are player-facing, so if you get players that get really angry when you roll well against them, this is your best friend because they, they have nobody to blame but themselves has an interesting mechanic called the usage die. Um, the usage die um, is basically a way of tracking 
ammo or food stores or resources of different kinds. And typically you roll a die. And I think if you roll a one, maybe a one or a two, then it goes down a die class. If you started with a D8, you roll your D8 after you use that. And then if you roll a one or a two, it goes down to a D6 the next time you use it, so on and so forth. Armor is used as a depletion. Uh, basically, you can use a, a point of armor to eliminate an attack so you don't take any damage from it. Uh, it does have more traditional classes than the other rules light RPGs that I have uh, talked about. There are clerics and wizards and thieves and warriors. And... Um, the hit dice is based, uh, the monsters are based on their hit die, much like I talked about earlier with uh, Sharp Swords and Sinister Spells. Uh, the damage is by class, not by weapon, so the warriors are going to have the best damage die, the wizards are going to have the worst. It does use advantage, like 5th edition, and the spells are all on, like, one page. So... Spells are by the character level. Characters can be from level 1 to 10. And each level, there are like four different spells available. Um, they are super simple, and they are very evocative of early D&D &D types of spells. If you read this list and you're familiar with Red Box D&D, &D, then these are going to all make sense to you. And... <clears throat> The Black Hack, then after the very short portion of the book that is for the rules, goes into different tables for creating random NPCs, how to create a hex crawl. Uh, you can randomly, this is another one of those drop tables, you can figure out what uh, an NPC looks like. Uh, there's stuff for generating entire uh, dungeons and adventures, and there's monsters back here. There's also some really interesting equipment available back here. But another thing that is really nice, besides the book is really cool too, uh, very well constructed, it's got the ribbon. Uh, another great thing about the Black Hack is it has inspired so many other hacks to go along with it. So, uh, Offshoots of the Black Hack include the Cthulhu Hack, basically adds rules for madness and for that Lovecraftian horror. The Rad Hack, so this would be a way to play Fallout or Gamma World. Uh, the Wasted Hack, this is much more in the vein of Fallout than Gamma World. This is more Gamma World. Um, and then the Wasted Hack actually has several different books uh, to add on to it. And all of these are super cheap. Even even this Black Hack book, I think maybe maybe 20 bucks or so I paid for this. But this is um, a great system. Like I said, I used this um, to finish up a campaign I had started in um, Old School Essentials. And the, the guys were getting a little bit bored with that. So we uh, the last adventure or so we um, we finished up in Black Hack. They really enjoyed that, and uh, I did as well. It was a nice break from Crunch. So that was my top five rules light RPG systems. This has been Justin from Books, Bricks, and Boards. Good gaming, and God bless.